Should cyclists in the UK have third-party cycling insurance? This is the insurance that kicks in if you're involved in an accident with a pedestrian, another bike user, or any vehicle, and they decide to take you to court. In this video, I'm going to try to get an independent and clear answer to that question that's been bothering me. Do I need third-party insurance? Clearly, I'm not at home in the Highlands. I've travelled to Edinburgh to meet an expert. To avoid any confusion, let's be clear, you do not legally have to have any insurance as a cyclist in the UK. And also, this is not the insurance that you'd use if your bike was stolen or damaged. That's something completely different, although insurance companies will often try and bundle third-party insurance with that one. Third-party insurance has kind of two parts to it, legal and let's call it accident. Legal, it should pay your legal costs if you end up going to court for whatever reason. And if it is found to be your fault, that's when the accident kicks in, it should pay compensation or repairs to the other person. That's the third party in all this. Cycling UK and other organisations offer third-party insurance with membership. British Cycling does too, but it won't represent you in an action with another British Cycling member. Others, such as Lacquer Club, offers it for just £1 a month, in the hope you'll also buy their other insurances. Insurance companies obviously stress the need for third-party cover. So who to turn to for independent advice? This is Jodie Gordon, and she's a lawyer who represents vulnerable road users. She's a partner with the legal firm Cycle Law Scotland. Jodie's a mountain and road biker. This is her commuting vehicle, and she's clear. It's all about your perception of risk. The real thing is looking at what the risk is. If you're sensible enough to be thinking about insurance and everything else, the chances are you're a fairly considerate cyclist, and therefore, what really is the need for insurance for you, given it's obviously it's not compulsory at the moment, but of course, if you are involved in an incident that you've caused, so you're on a shared use path and potentially you're involved in an incident with a pedestrian or another cyclist, then you at least would have cover in those circumstances and you wouldn't have to pay out of your own pocket if they try to raise an action against you. Sharing a path with other cyclists, runners, walkers and dog walkers, in Jody's experience, presents the biggest risk. The new highway code sets out a hierarchy of road users. While it doesn't presume the cyclist is liable in any collision with a pedestrian, it's clearly places like this where accidents leading to actions are most likely. Most definitely, yes. So on the roads, your biggest threat is obviously motor vehicles. But we know, looking at the statistics, car drivers pose a far greater risk to cyclists than the other way around. Of course, you may come into an altercation with a, a pedestrian or another cyclist while out on the road, but again, just taking into account where is it you're cycling? Are you cycling down heavy pedestrianised areas? And therefore, insurance might be something you want to look at, given the changes in the highway code. But the shared use path, certainly around Edinburgh, can be so busy at times that I think you are there is there's a potential risk obviously anytime you go out on your bike but the risk is greater when you are in uh, heavily cycle pedestrian dog walkers you name it they're out there using it as they should be but you then need to make sure you have that sense of, of shared use shared responsibility and potentially insurance there's a time and place for it in those circumstances so the thing that's striking me here is the speed that the cyclists are going Everyone using the path is, are using it for different reasons. So cyclists tend to be using it to get to a, from A to B. Um, runners are using it for some training, whereas there's a lot of pedestrians, dog walkers that are out just for a leisurely walk. So everyone's doing it at their own pace uh, for their own purpose. And I think because of that, that's where conflicts can arise. Just going to pause to say a huge thank you to all of these people who have joined the channel. If you'd like to know more about being a member, just click on the join button below any video, although that doesn't work on an iPhone, and uh, I will pop up with a little box and tell you all about it. Just about a way of giving a little bit of extra support to the work I'm doing here, which does take quite a lot of time and money to do. Before you rush to Google cheap third-party insurance, do check your home contents insurance because it might well cover you. 
And as for compulsory insurance for cyclists, Jodie is strongly opposed. So you've got children cycling to and from school. Do parents need to take a separate policy for their children? God. At what age do they then legally have to take responsibility themselves? Do they take their own policy at 60? So it becomes a very, very difficult situation to then unfold. And I think all that would happen as a result of any compulsory insurance, if we went as far as that, is the number of cyclists would reduce dramatically. And when the Scottish government are wanting to promote active travel, because we know the huge benefits that come from that, I think that's just going to stop it at the pass. Well, today has been absolutely fascinating and I've learned a heck of a lot. I think my conclusion is, is that it's a very personal decision that you have to make based on where you ride and your perception of the risk there. If I still rode regularly to work, then yeah, I'm pretty sure I would have third-party cycle insurance, especially, especially if I rode a lot on shared use paths, where I think I agree that conflict is much more likely. If you've enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up, check out the channel and have a good look around. You may even consider joining. See you again next time. Bye.